Welcome to the Inquirer 1.0. Today we have an upload on one of the most notorious London faces over the last four or five decades, Jimmy, Big Jim Moody. There's been quite a few videos done on him, but none with the depth that I'm going to offer today. So with that being said, if you can smash the likes out there, it helps get other people who are interested in this subject matter involved through YouTube's algorithms. Okay, let's get cracking, guys. Jimmy Moody was one of the most feared gangland enforcers over numerous decades, and will go down as perhaps the one man who spanned those decades as the UK's number one gunman for hire. In this episode, we're going to look at a number of infamous incidents in Moody's crazy life, leading up to his ultimate death that turned the predator into the prey. Moody was born in 1943 and was raised by a single mum after his father was killed in the Second World War. There was very little known about his childhood years, but in his 20s, Jimmy Moody was building a reputation for himself as a freelance enforcer and was particularly close with the South London Richardson firm, but also took out contracts from other firms, including the Craze. One of the most infamous incidents was the violent brawl at a club in Catford, Mr. Smith's and the Witch Doctor, which Moody alongside the Richardson firm on 7th of March, 1966, were involved in. The fight broke out after Eddie Richardson, Mad Frank, Moody and others were having a night out in the newly opened Mr. Smith's, which they had agreed to mine for the owners, two men from Manchester, with links to the Quality Street Gang. The issue that arose was that Billy Hayward and Flash Harry owned numerous pubs and clubs around Catford, and they saw it as their manner. They were doubly insulted that two Northerners had come down to London and, and into their patch without their permission. Hayward, Flash Harry, Big Peter Hennessy, Billy Gardner, Dickie Hart, Johnny Perry, Dougie Horn, and several others entered the club to check the place out and began a night of heavy drinking, unaware that the Richardsons were there to seal a new security deal with the Northerner owners. There was tension during the night as Billy Hayward had been having an affair with one of the Richardson firm, Roy Porritt's wife, and it's possible they thought Eddie and his firm had entered Mr Smith's to settle the score with Hayward and his pals. What happened next is subjective, depending on who you listen to. But at roughly 3 to 3.30 a.m., Eddie Richardson told Hayward and his pals to finish up and leave the club, which understandably was met with fury. Hayward and his pals were never going to have Eddie Richardson ordering him and his friends about. It just wasn't going to be tolerated. Dickie Hart, a junior member of the Cray firm, allegedly lost his head, pulled a pistol out and began shooting up the bar. At the same time, big Peter Hennessy, a giant of a man, called Eddie Richardson out for a straightener on the dance floor, which of course Eddie obliged, with the two of them going at it hammer and tongs. Whilst they were fighting, Rawlins took a bullet in the shoulder. Eddie and Frank were injured, and Dickie Hart was fatally shot. Little is said about who actually killed Dickie Hart, but in some corners, Moody is named as the trigger man, although Mad Frank was charged with the murder and was found not guilty. In Freddie Foreman's book, he claims that they know the killer and he wasn't arrested that night, which would rule Moody out. What is fact is that Moody grabbed hold of Eddie Richardson and Mad Frank, dragging them to safety away from the mayor. There had previously been bad blood between Eddie Richardson and Freddie Foreman, who was good friends with Hayward and his crew. Eddie had allegedly tried to extort a book he's owned by Foreman, and Fred claims in his book that he put a shooter under Richardson's nose and warned him off. A claim disputed by Eddie Richardson, but this could also have been a contributing factor between the two warring parties at Mr Smith's. The Mr Smith's affair propelled Moody's name in the London underworld, and his reputation was enhanced after beating up two detectives investigating the Richardson firm. No charges were brought, but the following year, he and his brother Richard were jailed for the manslaughter of a merchant navy steward they got into a row with, and as a consequence, were not to see the light of day until 1972. On his release, Jimmy upped the stakes, becoming a member of the infamous Chainsaw Gang, or Thursday Gang, named such because of their habit of committing security van robberies on Thursday, which back then was usually the wages day. 
The gang was put together by a respected East End villain, Charlie Chopper Nye, but his thoughts were being financed by Bigger Fish. Millie was recruited to be the heavy of the outfit, wielding a shotty during the robberies to keep potential wannabe heroes in check. The gang were extremely successful and worked the length and breadth of the country, even into Scotland, and Moody was a key member. The Blackwall Tunnel job provided robbers throughout London with a new phrase that summed it up for the buzz, that what they experienced thanks to the thrill of pulling off the robbery, and it's an expression that many criminals would use subsequently. As one of the gang later explained, the buzz on that job was better than any drugs. All that adrenaline pumping through you was fucking incredible. And the feeling of elation once you snatched that cash was out of this world. The transfer of the cash into the getaway vehicle was always done with precision time because the more time it took, the more likely it was that the police would arrive and nobody wanted to shoot out. The gang escaped from the Blackwall Tunnel that day with almost £100,000 in wage packets destined for Greenwich hospitals. Only a small fraction of the cash was ever recovered. Jimmy was widely regarded as a man of serious violence by this time. And he also looked the part with his piercing eyes, bushy eyebrows and thick set bodybuilding frame. A former friend and associate of Jimmy Moody from South London told me. I met Jim on a job and we got pretty friendly. He was a bit of a loner and worked for a number of different firms, sort of a freelancer. He was quiet, but one look in his eyes and he knew not to mess with him. I remember one incident, we were out on a drink up around the West End. Champagne was flowing. We just had a nice touch and we're out on a celebration with the chaps, including Big John Woodruff and Tony Knightley, two respected blaggers. A little mob from North London got a bit leery, and before I could get out of my seat, Jimmy a glass one with a bottle of champers and right hooked the other unconscious. We ran over and gave them a good shoeing on the floor, but Jim had done the job already. We lost touch after. He went on the run, but I hear he ended up being a paid killer, which doesn't surprise me. It was a natural when it came to inflicting pain. It wasn't long before Moody was arrested and remanded for an armed robbery. His cellmate was provisional Republican member, Gerard Toot. The two men and fellow robber Stan Thompson escaped Brixton prison on 16th of December, 1980, which put them to the top of Scotland Yard's most wanted list. It was alleged that Moody had been paid 10,000 by the Republican group to help get Toot out of prison. Fleeing to Northern Ireland, Moody worked with a provisional Republican group. It was there that Moody coined the expression of awarding someone an OBE, one behind the ear, a shot in the head, a play on an OBE ward. The expression was reportedly used by killers in Belfast for the next decade or so. Toot was later arrested in Dublin. Moody crossed back over to London and kept a low profile in a little flat in Waddison Street, a grimy, squalid place, not much wider than an alleyway off Hackney's busy Mayor Street. The flat number 12 was on the first floor of the kind of low-rise block that since the 1960s had replaced much of East London's housing. Hardly less shabby than the mean streets they replaced, the flats are small and look fragile, despite the fortress-like mentality of their occupant, where he spent most of his time religiously working out and becoming a hulking bodybuilder. He managed to stay under the radio for some time, and it's alleged during this time he was working as a contract killer both in Ireland and the UK, but no absolute proof of that. Interestingly enough, it was found out after Moody's death that the actual flat he was staying in was a council property, and there was lots of questions asked about how he'd been given and granted a council property uh, under one of his aliases. In 1990 to 91, Moody became embroiled in a South London power struggle between three families, the Dailies, Brindles and the Arifs which would ultimately bring about his downfall. In September 1990, a Brindle associate, Stephen Dalligan, was wounded after being shot seven times by Ahmed Abi Abdullah, a Turkish gunman working for the Arabs. The following March, Abdullah was shot in a South London betting shop by two men. Brothers Anthony and Patrick Brindle were charged with the murder, but later acquitted at the Old Bailey. Sometimes after this, David Brindle walked into a daily pub with a gun shouting abuse and threatening the dailies, who happened to be drinking with one Jimmy Moody. Moody smashed Brindle over the head with a baseball bat and sent him packing. In August 91, David Brindle was shot in a Woolworth pub by two men who burst in and sprayed the bar with bullets, yelling, this is for Abby. The theory in the underworld 
is that the shout, this is for Abby, was to confuse matters. And it's widely known that Jimmy Moody was one of the hitmen who killed David. In 1993, Jimmy Moody left his council house to enjoy a pint at the Royal Hotel, a shabby type of bar in East London, a place people minded their own business. It was Moody's local bar, and he used to enjoy a few pints there, most nights of the week. But this would have only been known by close acquaintances. One of the owners, Sharon, said of Moody, I didn't know his past, but he was a fine man and seemed very caring. He talked about his baby granddaughter sometimes. He was devoted to her. He would get very upset when he heard stories about child molesters. He sometimes remonstrated with smokers. Otherwise, in the bar at least, he was fine. On the night of his death, Moody was sipping a cold pint in his regular place at the bar when a man appeared in the doorway, quietly ordering a pint of Foster's lager. He paid for his drink, then without touching his drink, he backed away from the bar, moved casually past Moody and reached inside his pocket, shooting Moody point blank four times. This definitely wasn't the gunman's first rodeo. It had all the marks of an execution, says a police officer on the case, but the killer did an odd thing for a professional. He swore at his victim while pulling the trigger. High killers don't usually betray such emotional signs. Detective Superintendent Harry Wilkins viewed Moody's body in the morgue and said, it was considerably older looking than his picture, Wilkins says, but it was the body of a man who kept himself in trim. The police officer noted that two bullet holes in the back, a third in the head and a fourth in the chest. He examined the contents of Moody's pockets, which included house keys, 90 pounds in cash. A closer inspection of the body revealed attempts to remove tattoos of an eagle and a geisha girl, or geisha girl, should I say, from the arms. But there was no doubt the 18 stone body was that of 53 year old James Moody. Moody was once dubbed the hardest man in London, but in the end, he died the way he lived violently, as so many in the underworld do. He will undoubtedly go down as one of, if not the most notorious gangsters or assassins or enforcers, whichever you would want to call him in the UK. The identity of the killer has never been revealed. The sport sources I've spoken to claim that Danny Roth, a lethal hitman who is said to have killed the great train robber Charlie Wilson, was Moody's, was Moody's killer. Now Danny Scarface Roth has passed away, the theory can be mentioned, but ultimately not confirmed, as is the norm in this secretive underbelly of London. Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode. There will be more to come in the future. Um, if you did enjoy it, make sure you hit the subscribe and the notify. And if you can hit a like if you enjoyed it as well, that would be fantastic. Okay, guys, take care.